All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Today we'll be talking about chemical bonds. Hope you like my joke. All right, so first we're just going to start with some review. So an atom, which we learned in quarter two, was the smallest unit of matter, and we consider it indivisible. While atoms have smaller parts within them, um, they don't have the same properties. So atom is indivisible. And then we have electron shells. These are going to be super important from here on out. So you know that the atomic number is the amount of electrons in a stable atom. And that electrons vary in the amount of energy they have. So they occur at certain levels. You can be at n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, and so on. Like our Bohr model said. Electron shells determine how an atom behaves when it encounters other atoms. So depending on how many shells and how many valence electrons you have, that's what determines a chemical bond. So electrons are placed into shells according to the following rules. The first shell holds two electrons, and each shell thereafter can hold eight. And then the second rule is the octet rule. So atoms tend to gain, lose, or share electrons so as to have eight electrons. So octet, if you think about a stop sign being an octagon and it has eight sides, oct is the prefix for eight. So the octet rule means we want eight electrons. So if we look at the pictures here, C would like to. So if we go to carbon, C, we have four electrons on the outside. So we need to do what to get to eight? That's right, we should be gaining four electrons. Now let's look at N. N has one, two, three, four, five valence electrons on the outside, and it has space for three more. So N would like to gain three electrons. Notice how both of these are nonmetals and they're gaining electrons. Oxygen has six electrons on the outside, so it has space for two. So we would like it to gain how many electrons? That's right, we want it to gain two electrons. Now, hydrogen here uh, is not a metal, but it is on the metal side, so it can act a little silly. So it can either gain an electron to get to a full shell of two, or it can give away its only electron in a bond. It just depends. Why are electrons important? So you learned in quarter two that electrons have different electron configurations. And different electron configurations mean that they have different levels of bonding. So they can do different things depending on what they have. So for instance here, this is the periodic table, just a snippet of it in terms of shells. So the first row of the periodic table is the first shell with one and two electrons. Helium has a full shell. Neon and argon both have full shells too. That's why these are circled in this red um, box because they're noble gas configurations. They're stable. Now lithium and beryllium and sodium and magnesium, these four are metals on this left side and they're going to lose electrons. They just want to get rid of that shell altogether. So if lithium gives away that electron, it'll only have a full shell of two. It just won't have a second shell. Um, electron dot structures you also learned, so your Lewis dot structures from module one, and these show the valence shell electrons, and those are the only ones that bond. So what is bonding really? Chemical bonds are basically just an attempt to fill their electron shells. These lone pair electrons, as we call them, are lonely, and they want a partner so that they have a full shell of eight. And there are three types of bonds. There are ionic bonds, covalent bonds, and metallic bonds. We'll be focusing mostly on the first two. So let's think about this. So I have an element, and it has one valence electron here. This X with one dot would be the electron dot formula for which of these? Sodium, potassium, and aluminum. So which one of these three has one valence electron? You're right, it's sodium, because sodium is in group one. All right, here we have five valence electrons. What, which one of these three would it be the electron dot formula for? Boron, nitrogen, or phosphorus? 
All right, this would be the dot structure for nitrogen, which has five valence electrons because it is in group 5A. So, getting into the types of bonds. An ionic bond results when metals react with nonmetals. So metals lose electron to match the number of valence electrons to the nearest noble gas. So that will be the noble gas before. So neon is a noble gas number 10. And sodium is number 11. Sodium will lose its 11th electron so that it will have the same amount as neon for 10. Positive ions form when the number of electrons are less than the number of protons. So if you lose an electron, you're getting rid of a negative charge, and you'll be overall positive. So let's look at this. Sodium right here has one valence electron, and we're going to lose it. So we have Na+. Plus. We have a plus where that electron used to be. So instead of having 11 protons and 11 electrons, we now have 11 protons and 10 electrons, so we have an overall charge of plus 1. Magnesium has two valence electrons, so it has two electrons to lose. So we go from 12 and 12 to 12 and 10, so the charge on a magnesium ion is 2 plus. So if we look at the periodic table, some typical ions on the periodic table. If you're in group 1 on the periodic table, you'll have a plus one charge. And if you have a group, if you're in group two on the periodic table, you'll have a plus two charge. And then group 13, otherwise known as 3A, will have a plus three charge. So let's check. So the number of valence electrons in aluminum. Aluminum is in group 13 or 3A, so it has three electrons that are valence. So now, is it going to lose 3 or is it going to gain 5? And your last question to think about, the ionic charge of aluminum, what would that be? So depending on what it does, what will the aluminum ion be? Will it be something where it gained 5 electrons or will it be where it lost 3? Go ahead and think about that for about 10 more seconds. All right, were you right? If you were, awesome job. If not, we're going to do a little bit more practice. So given the ionic charge for each of the following, 12 protons and 10 electrons. So these are subtraction problems. So I'll do the first one with you. 12 minus 10, that would be 2 plus. So the answer would be a positive 2 charge. All right, B, what if you had 50 protons and 46 electrons? You're right, you would have the charge of 4 plus. Now what if you had 15 protons and 18 electrons? Good, that would be a charge of 3 minus. You have 3 extra electrons. All right, in ionic compounds, nonmetals in groups 15, 16, and 17 gain electrons. So that's 5A, 6A, and 7A. And nonmetals add electrons to achieve the octet arrangement. And those charges are 3 minus, 2 minus, or 1 minus, depending on how many electrons they gained. So here's an example of that math for fluorine. And because it's an ion, we call it fluoride. So the unpaired electron, this is fluorine, but now that we've lost it, or we've gained an electron, this is fluoride. So ionic bonds occur between atoms of metals and nonmetals that have very different electronegativity. That means they have, so if you have seven valence electrons and one valence electrons, those would bond together. The bond is formed by the transfer of electrons, so they give away that electron, and it produces charge ions in all states. They conduct electricity and they have a high melting point. And then here are your examples. So one of them is salt, something that you should be familiar with. So I have an Na and a Cl here and I have Na with one valence electron and Cl with seven. My Na is going to just go ahead and give that electron to chlorine and they'll bond together. 
So chlorine went and stole this electron, or in this picture, stole this bone from the Na to make NaCl. And here's a little demonstration of that. So this electron travels from the Na to the chlorine. You can tell from the pink arrow. So then now Na has one shell less, and Cl has a full octet on its third shell. So the ionic bond shows you a transfer, it, ca it causes an imbalance, so the Na is positive and the Cl is negative. And as we know, opposite charges attract each other, so they stay bonded. It looks a little something like this. Alright, the next type of bond that we're going to talk about is the covalent bond. So covalent bonds occur between non-metallic elements of similar electron activity. That means it occur occurs between a non-metal and a non-metal. And you share electron pairs, so it's like they're holding hands. And they're stable, and they do not conduct heat or electricity. So there's no charge running through them at all. You're sharing electrons like you're holding hands at the park. So it's not going to cause a charge. There's no imbalance. And some examples are O2, which is just oxygen bonded to itself. Carbon dioxide, which you see all the time. Water is a covalent bond, so it's two nonmetals. So right here, each of these have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven um, valence electrons. So these are the same element or in the same group. These two lone pairs right here in the middle are going to line up with each other and then create a bond and hold hands. And that's what a covalent bond looks like. So if you have a polyatomic ion, which we'll learn about in module 3, or a diatomic, there are seven and you need to have those memorized, those are always covalent bonds. Then there are two types of covalent bonds. There's nonpolar covalent bonds when electrons are shared equally. Anything that's diatomic, so it's bonded to itself, is a nonpolar covalent bond. They're perfectly in the middle. The H and the H are totally even. But then there's also polar covalent bonds where it's a little different. So here, I'm going to show you a nonpolar covalent bond. It's oxygen with itself, and these two electrons in the middle are perfectly even. They're not pulling it one way or another. and that makes your oxygen molecule O2. The next thing is polar covalent bonds. So that's when electrons are shared, um, but not equally. That should say, but not equally. So you have H2O here, and that's where they're different. So polar covalent bonds unevenly matched, but they are willing to share. So see how these are two different types of dogs, but they each have a bone? So it's matching, or it's not matching, but they are sharing. So what that looks like, you have two H's and one O. And the O here is going to be negative because it's getting two electrons from the H. So the O got two electrons, but the H's only gave away one each. So that means this whole thing is closer to the oxygen than it is to the hydrogen. So the electrons hover closer to the O than they do to the H. And the last bond is metallic bond. You will not be tested on metallic bonds unless you are an honors student, um, but just so you have that information. So metallic bonds are bonds formed between metals, and it's b with the electron cloud. And they can still conduct electricity because they're metals. They're shiny, and it takes forever for them to melt. So you could not melt any of these in our um, examples in our classroom. So. Metallic bonds are sort of mellow dogs with plenty of bones to go around, is how you can think about it. And I'll send out these um, green dog videos separately. So ionic bonds are kind of a sea of electron. They're not touching each other, but they're just attracted because of the charges. Metals, however, they don't combine, they form alloys. So that means it's a metal dissolved in a metal, like steel, brass, bronze, and pewter. So pewter, if you are a Harry Potter fan, is like the stuff that they use to make cauldrons. That's the alloy that you'll be looking at. And this is just a preview for modules to come, but we will be talking about the weights of these compounds, and that's just the sum of their atomic masses to find their formula. So if you have carbon dioxide, that's CO2, to find the mass of that, you would just do C plus O plus O. But that is all our famous bonds of the past have for you today.